Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another rendition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. Today, we are joined by a very special guest. We have Brett Wells here uh, with our sponsors, Sigma. Thanks for joining us, Brett. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Yeah, we appreciate you being here. Uh, like I said, big thanks goes out to Sigma for sponsoring this event. Uh, Brett's going to be talking to us today about some advanced macro photography. Without any further ado, Brett, take it away. The floor is yours. Thank you, Scott. Uh, let's start uh, with talking about some of the, the necessary equipment for uh, this type of work. It'll apply to a lot of, of macro in general, um, but particularly for uh, advanced macro, some of the techniques that we're going to be talking about uh, today, some of these things become really, really critical. Uh, you might be able to do some, some basic kind of macro photography uh, without a tripod, for instance, but when you get to something that's greater than one-to-one -one reproduction, it's almost impossible to, to handhold the camera uh, for a lot of reasons. I mean, you're going to shake the camera uh, and that's going to be magnified uh, in, the, in the image. Um, <clears throat> the subject might be moving even more, but um, there's also very little depth of field, so to have any kind of control over that, um, the camera's going to be on a tripod, but, um, and it's going to become really important for this too. The more solid that tripod is, the easier it's going to be to work with. Um, a really uh, lightweight uh, tripod that has a lot of vibrations uh, in it as you set things up and move some of these rigs around, and I'll show you some examples um, of how I set up some of these shots uh, as well, but when you set up like that, um, there can be, it can be hard to control the vibrations in, in the system. So um, have some, having something that's really rock solid um, can work, is gonna work better. Uh, there are camera stands if you have access to something like that, that can uh, help move the camera in different positions uh, and keep things nice and solid. Uh, you might be shooting directly on a table because uh, we're generally dealing with very short working distances here. So, uh, there are tabletop tripods that are appropriate, but again, you need something pretty beefy and, uh, and secure. You definitely want some way to trigger the camera without pushing the button on the camera. I'd say that's true of any kind of macro photography, uh, unless you're using a flash maybe, but <clears throat> specifically for uh, more advanced techniques, uh, lining up images or um, getting in, uh, you know, to, to larger than life size, you're going to want some way to trigger that camera without touching it. Um, fortunately, for a lot of this type of thing, things aren't moving. You can use uh, the timer on your camera and it will work okay. Uh, just give it enough, you know, two, three, four, or five seconds maybe, um, so you have enough time for the, the vibrations to dampen out uh, and then the, the shutter can open. Uh, cable releases of any kind, whether it's an electronic cable release, a manual one, if your camera still takes something like that, uh, a remote uh, release, you know, wireless, anything like that, perfectly fine. A lot of cameras today have apps for your phones, uh, computers, whatever, uh, and there, there are lots of ways to trigger cameras that way too. That's perfectly fine. Just some way that we're not touching the, uh, the camera. Uh, a lot of these things, a lot of the techniques that we're going to go through today, um, I was using uh, something called a, a nodal rail or a macro rail. Um, sometimes they're called uh, nodal slides. Um, I will, I'll, I'll try to sh point that out to you in the images uh, as we go through there. Uh, it's kind of like a long lens plate. Some of them are geared. Uh, the one I'm using uh, that I was using for a lot of these aren't. Uh, but you, there are geared rails. Um, there's some that even move forward and backward, left and right. Uh, there are uh, even higher end setups that uh, adjust the camera position electronically. Uh, and that's an option as well if you have access to that kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, when we're dealing with uh, this level of macro, you're going to be losing a lot more exposure than you are even with uh, regular macro photography. Um, as you extend the lens from the camera, you have less and less exposure. We'll talk about that uh, when we get to some of the settings and things. but. Um, having some light to uh, bring to the party is going to make your life a lot easier. It's going to make the shutter speeds a lot shorter, uh, more manageable. Uh, you also can highlight things, um, cast light from the side of a subject maybe and show off some texture, uh, things like that. You, a lot of modern LEDs, uh, you can change the color temperatures so that could come in handy so you can balance lights, that kind of thing. Um, they, you can use reflectors, uh, maybe a light on one side, a reflector on the other, window light on one side, reflector on the other, those kind of things will work as well, just to bring more light into, uh, into the scene. Uh, light boxes, I've seen light boxes used a number of different ways, or light panels, if you will, but we used to use light boxes to look at negatives or slides, and 
a lot of us still have those sitting around. So they can be quite useful. You can use them just as a small soft box on the side of your image. You can actually use them as a background um, behind an image or even underneath a subject to illuminate a subject from, from underneath. Um, just try to be creative with your, your lights. Um, there are never enough uh, clamps, arms, stands, all sorts of other stuff. I have, if you could see around me here, there's a bunch of um, lighter weight tripods that are holding up little uh, LEDs and I use those a lot with uh, tabletop work. Uh, I have some tabletop tripods as well. Um, with uh, a little LED panel on it. I'll throw that on the table there. Uh, so something like that uh, can be really useful. Again, uh, hold a reflector, hold a light, um, hold a smaller camera maybe, something like that. Uh, accessories, hold the subject, backgrounds, uh, all sorts of things like that. Clamps of any kind, uh, you can get them at the hardware store. They make more uh, dedicated photo kinds of things uh, like the Wimberley Plamp, that's a good option. Um, <clears throat> so those kind of things as well. And then Think about the surfaces you're shooting on, if you're going to see any of that underneath the subject or behind the subjects, backgrounds behind the subjects. Um, you can create artificial backgrounds. Uh, you can use almost any, any uh, surface and keep the light from hitting it and it'll go darker. You can add more light to it and it'll go lighter. Uh, you can change the, the color temperature of lights uh, and alter backgrounds uh, as well. So some basic techniques of things um, that are going to apply to most of this type of work. Uh, th things that I find uh, easy, at least, that are going to apply to most of these things. The first of them is for focusing, for composing images, all that kind of stuff, you're going to want to be able to open the aperture up. When you're at extreme macro, um, the images tend to be very, very dark. Uh, and when you have large, larger depth of field, sometimes it's harder to focus critically. It's easier to focus with the aperture wide open. You'll be able to see better. You'll be able to see the shallower depth of field. Uh, then you can uh, move the camera forward or backward uh, and then close it back down uh, to wherever the setting was that you were using uh, when you're going to, to take the picture. <clears throat> uh, a lot of times you can focus with the focus ring on a lens for some of these things it actually becomes less, it, less important to do it that way. And instead of just moving the entire camera forward or backward, or in the case of a bellows, you can move the whole standard of the bellows forward or backward. Uh, and you're doing the same thing. You're moving the focus group in the lens farther from the camera, closer to the camera uh, and changing the focus. But sometimes it's easier to do it with a different aspect. Um, so don't think that you're just limited to using the focus ring on the lens. And again, we'll talk about these as we go through each of the, uh, the techniques that we're going to talk about today. Uh, next trick is focus. This I learned from view cameras. If you've ever used a big 4x5, 8x10 view camera, uh, sometimes it was hard to tell exactly where the focus was because you didn't have really shallow depth of fields like a 1.4 prime uh, maybe on an, on an SLR. Uh, or today's mirrorless camera or something like that. So the, the trick that I learned is you focus until you're past where you want to be and you know you're out of focus, turn the focus back the other way until it's just as out of focus and then focus right in the middle of those two points. Um, so you can do that with a focus ring. I, I know that that's out of focus, that's out of focus. I'll turn it right back in the middle and that's going to get my focus right in between those two points. Um, and again, you can use that with bellows, you can use that with uh, macro rails, uh, different things like that as well. Uh, time before shooting, don't just think you're going to set everything, change your aperture, and then grab the cable release and fire off a shot. Uh, it is going to take a couple seconds for the vibrations in the system. Uh, the tripod, the camera, the lens, the bellows, whatever it is you're using, it's going to take a little bit of time for those vibrations to dampen out. So allow that. Otherwise, you're going to get some really soft images, I promise. Uh, generally speaking, these are, um, for these types of techniques, we're photographing things that aren't moving. A lot of times we're inside in controlled environments, so the shutter speeds are not critical. The shutter speed is actually how I balance my exposure uh, or, or adjust my exposure and set my exposure. Um, so I'm usually setting my ISO to the lowest that it'll go on the camera. Um, just cleaner images, um, better color, better dynamic range all those kind of things. Um, aperture, you're usually going to be up at the higher end of your aperture range. 
the closer you get to the camera, the less depth of field that your images will have. So the more magnification you have, the less depth of field you have. Um, so in order to keep any kind of depth of field, you're usually going to set the apertures up higher. Uh, most lenses will go up to 16, 22, maybe the 32. Uh, Nikon has a trick that as you lose exposure by uh, macro, by focusing closer to the subject, uh, it adjusts the aperture. So it might tell you that your aperture is actually a number higher than your lens is supposed to go to anyway, maybe even two. Um, consider diffraction. Diffraction is just a phenomenon where um, light doesn't focus evenly. It starts to soften out um, with, and it's more noticeable with smaller apertures, the, the smaller openings, the larger numbers, but that's what gives us more depth of field. So it's something that you should be aware of uh, I always get this question, like, where do I, where, where should you stop to not have diffraction? It really depends on the lens. It depends on the camera, um, depends on the, the resolution, depends on how much you're going to enlarge the image. Um, my theory is it's digital. We've already paid for the camera and the memory card. Let's just try different combinations. Um, so I might shoot the same thing at F11, F16, F22, F32, uh, wherever my camera goes to uh, and try it out. Um, or um, just test it and then look at it on a computer. You know, shoot it a couple different ways, go back to the computer, blow it up to 100%, and, and you'll see a slight softening. But the real question is what's acceptable to you? You know, that's the best answer I can give you for diffraction. There really is no magic formula, um, there's no right or wrong. Uh, it will happen, but again, it's a question of what your needs are, or what your, your intentions are uh, for the image. So then I said, again, um, I'm gonna set my exposure with the shutter speed, and then I'm gonna bracket with the shutter speed as well if I need to do that. If I want something a little higher, a little lower, um, maybe I need to do HDR on something. Uh, hopefully I can control that with the lights. Um, but even if I wanna just shoot a little lighter, a little darker to make sure that I get highlight detail or shadow detail, whatever the case may be, I can do all of that with the shutter speed because it's not changing anything except the total amount of light coming into the camera. All right, my aperture is already controlled depth of field, my ISO is already set. So the shutter speed is really only controlling um, the brightness of the image, the, the exposure of the image at that point. <clears throat> Some considerations for uh, taking macro beyond uh, the, the, a normal kind of macro. Um, I've mentioned some of these things already, but more magnification means less light. Uh, at one to one, uh, life-size reproduction in the system um, or on the sensor, no matter what the camera is, no matter what the lens is, if the subject is reproduced at one-to-one -one at life-size, you're going to lose two stops of exposure. It's physics, um, but basically once I've, to do that, I had to double the distance from the focusing group in the lens to the sensor. When you do that, the image circle is twice as big. Um, and when you double the diameter of a circle, you actually have half of the surface area or four times the surface area. Um, sorry, 2.8 times the surface area, which is two stops, one, 1.4, two, 2.8. Um, so I get a quarter of the exposure. I'm losing two stops of light. There's nothing I can do about that other than increase my exposure through shutter speed uh, or whatever ISO if I have to. <clears throat> Just a... Uh... Quick, quick question here coming in from Judith, uh, yeah. who wanted to know, in terms of these principles, do the same principles apply when using macro filters? Um, basically, yes. Um, so a macro filter, and that is something that I'll highlight in this, uh, also known as a diopter magnifying filter. But when all it's doing is spreading out the image, sort of like a, a teleconverter would do, so if you think about it this way, I have the same amount of light going through a lens and I put a macro magnifying filter on the front. It's just enlarging the image. So I had the same amount of light spread over a greater area. So I'm still losing exposure. Um, but all of those other techniques, if I'm magnifying the image, I still need to be careful about depth of field. I still need to be careful about the camera shake. Uh, all of those other things are still going to, to apply. Um, in general, a normal diopter, you're not going to get that much more uh, magnification, maybe double, maybe three times. There are diopters that'll go up to 10x, 
Um, so you're actually going to get 10 times the amount of magnification, and then it becomes really critical. So sometimes these, these principles that we've been talking about really depend on how much more magnification you're trying to get out of a system. Um, but we'll talk about diopters a little bit more uh, when we get to that uh, section. Okay. Um, so depth of field decreases as focus distance decreases. In order to get the subject larger, I have to get closer to it. Um, some of these things like uh, extension tubes and bellows and whatever um, just enable me to focus closer to the subject. And when I focus closer to the subject, I have less depth of field. Um, again, it's physics, uh, but the closer I get, it, even at one to one, you, could, you may have a quarter of an inch or an eighth of an inch of depth of field uh, when you're at you know, three to one, five to one, uh, even 10 to one, which is really, really extreme, but you, you could have um, a fraction of a millimeter, literally, uh, of depth of field. Uh, on depth of field, if I increase my aperture, don't change anything else, but increase my aperture to stops, I'll have twice as much depth of field. I'll have to change ISO or shutter speed to compensate exposure, but if I don't move the camera, if I don't move the subject, if I don't refocus, um, any of those kind of things, if I just move my aperture, um, I will increase it two stops. From f8 to f16, I'll have twice as much depth of field. So if I had a millimeter before, now I have two. If I had a quarter inch before, now I have a half an inch. Um, it can complicate the uh, exposure. Um, and again, there could be diffraction, but just kind of a rough estimate. If you know, like, I don't have anywhere close to the right amount of depth of field, um, then I need to um, increase my aperture a lot. If I just need a little bit more, one stop's probably going to do it. Uh, there are some uh, apps out there uh, for smartphones, uh, computers, whatever. Uh, PhotoPills is always on my phone, and it does just about everything you'd ever want to do. Uh, it'll tell you all the nice um, where to find things, what time of day to photograph things, the, the phase of the sun and moon, uh, phase of the moon, sun, phase of the moon, um, times for sunrise and sunsets, those kind of things but it will also tell me uh, depth of field. It will tell me uh, this lens on this camera, this distance, this is how much uh, depth of field I'm gonna have, uh, those types of things. So it's a nice thing to have. Uh, tell you where to put focus points, how much uh, of your depth of field is gonna be in front of the focus point, how much is in the back, uh, all that sort of thing. And then there's a, a really nice uh, website that I came across in, in putting together this presentation. Uh, it's extreme-macro.co.uk. And they have a page of calculators far more than you're probably ever going to want. Um, I'm pretty technical when it comes to photography and I kind of geek out on some of this stuff and it was a little much for me even, but there's some really, really useful calculators on there for figuring out what happens when I use bellows, what happens when I use uh, uh, extension tubes, what happens when I use uh, teleconverters, any of those kind of things. Uh, it'll give you some of the formulas for figuring out um, like which lens I should use and those sorts of things. All right, so let's talk about diopters. Um, nice that that was the first question that came up anyway. Uh, a diopter is a filter that screws on the front of the lens. Uh, I'm gonna skip to the second one. Uh, they'll fit on any lens that has the same filter thread. If you don't know a filter thread, I'll give you a trick. Pull the lens cap off the front of the, of the lens and it'll tell you. I, I don't think I've ever seen a lens cap that didn't have a number stamped on the inside. There's usually a, a circle with a diagonal line through it and that's a, a symbol for diameter. And then it's gonna tell you a number. So this is 67. That means that um, the clips or the thread on the lens that it goes on is 67 millimeters across. Um, so I know that for uh, this 2870, I can use any 67 millimeter uh, filter. And then if I have another lens with that same filter thread, I could use that same filter uh, on that as well. Um, and it, so diopters, like I said before, close-up filters, macro filters, magnifiers, magnifying filters, there's all sorts of names for them, um, but that's basically what they are is a magnifying glass if you wanna think about it that way. Um, some of them are dedicated. Uh, our 18 to 300 contemporary lens, we make a dedicated diopter. Um, out of the box by itself, the lens is one to three or one third life size reproduction. With the diopter on it, it becomes one to two. So you're getting another um, third or 50% however you want to look at that. But um, you're going to take it from a third life size to half life size with that diopter. Now that diopter works on other lenses as well. Again, anything that has that 
um, same filter thread. So you could use it on a macro lens and get a little bit more. You can use it on a non-macro lens and get some get closer to macro. Um, as I mentioned, they are available, uh, pretty readily available up to 10x, but that's pretty extreme. Normally they're 2x, 3x, um, something in that range. So they'll kind of give you um, you know, 50% more double um, three times what the lens was capable of without it. Um, they are going to reduce your close focus distance, minimum focus distance. So with that on there, you can get closer to the subject and that's how you're achieving the macro. With the filter on the lens, you're going to lose infinity focus, which means you can't focus on the mountains in the distance anymore. It's okay because you can just take the, the filter back off. You're not modifying anything. Um, they can be a problem with image quality. A less than great lens, a less than ideal filter, you're probably gonna get results that aren't um, what you're looking for or not wonderful. Um, with a really good lens and a really good filter, especially a dedicated pair that were designed to work with each other, you can have some really, really great images with them. So, um, and I'll show you some here in just a second. Um, but that's just be aware that there can be a loss of sharpness. There can be extra chromatic aberration or other issues caused by uh, diopters. So that is with the, the filter that was actually designed for the 18 to 300. Um, I put on the 18 to 35 instead and took that from, uh, you know, up about another third or 50% more magnification than what the lens was capable of. Uh, without it. Uh, that is the 18 to 300 or with the 18 to 300 contemporary uh, without a filter. And then that's the same shot, just putting the filter on the front of the lens. And then I recomposed a little bit, uh, tweaked the light and got a good final image uh, out of that, but at half life size reproduction instead of a third. Okay. Let's move on to teleconverters. So you're probably familiar with teleconverters already. Uh, a teleconverter is a, an accessory lens that fits on the back, normally, we're going to talk about rear teleconverters, um, fits on the back side of the lens or between the lens and the camera body, if you want to think about it that way. Um, they magnify an image just like they do when you use them the way a lot of people or most people might use a teleconverter for shooting sports, for shooting wildlife, for shooting things farther away, it makes the subject bigger. Uh, for macro, it's going to do exactly the same thing. It's just going to magnify the subject, making it larger than it was without it. Um, teleconverters usually come in 1.4x or 2x. Uh, and there's a reason for that. That 1.4 isn't just a random number. Uh, 1.4, if I increase the magnification by 1.4, uh, enlarge the image circle by that much, I lose one stop of light. And that's why the, the, the normal starting point for teleconverters is 1.4. It'll magnify the subject by that number. So the subject will be 40% larger uh, and I will lose one stop of light. A 2X converter is gonna double everything. So the subject will be twice as large. I'll lose two stops of light. Um, and again, I can compensate that with shutter speed or aperture or whatever. Uh, again, next one, loss of light, loss of exposure, loss of aperture, however you want to think about that. Uh, one stop for 1.4, two stops for 2x. There are others. Uh, occasionally, you'll find a 1.7. Uh, I've seen 1.2s. I've even seen a 3x, but they're kind of random. 99% uh, of teleconverters out there are 1.4 or 2. <clears throat> the nice thing about using teleconverters for macro is I'm not changing the minimum focus distance. So I'm not losing, I'm not having to get right on top of a subject, but I can get more magnification. I don't even have to get any closer to the subject and I get more magnification out of the system. Um, that can be a big advantage. Some of these techniques, if you aren't careful, you end up being you know, a quarter of an inch or half an inch from the front of your lens to the subject. That kind of gets unmanageable. So the teleconverters can be a nice way uh, to do this. I'm also not losing infinity focus because I'm just magnifying what's coming in through the camera, through the lens, so I can still focus at infinity even with that on there. It just enlarges everything um, all the way from infinity to the closest focus. Uh, there can be a slight loss of sharpness. You are putting extra pieces of glass in the system. Again, starting with a good lens, and a good teleconverter, you're going to get a good result. Um, using less than good lenses uh, and generic teleconverters, uh, they may not. A word on teleconverters, uh, they 
generally are designed to work with, uh, or they're designed by a manufacturer to work with their lenses. Um, so we have a, a series um, that we call the Global Vision um, Teleconverters, again, a 1.4 and a 2X, uh, the TC1401 and, and TC2001. And they're designed to work with uh, a number of our lenses in the art sport contemporary line. Um, it's not to say that they couldn't work on other lenses, but they're not designed to. And nobody's gonna, nobody's really tested out all the combinations. Um, so you wanna be careful matching them together. Uh, sometimes the front of a teleconverter, the piece of glass actually sticks out from the front and the rear element of some lenses protrudes from the back. So you wanna be careful too, that they can physically fit together. You could actually damage a lens or a teleconverter uh, by trying to force something together that wasn't designed to work together. Uh, I promised somebody earlier some, some coffee beans. Uh, so that's with our uh, 105 uh, uh, DGDN, uh, the new macro uh, for uh, Sony E mount and for Leica Panasonic Sigma L mount. Um, that's actually on the FP camera, which is the camera that you're looking at me through right now. This is the little FPL, the new one, uh, the higher resolution. But uh, so this is just the straight lens all the way at one to one. I just turned the lens around until I was focused at its closest. And then I moved the camera closer to the subject until it was in focus. So I know that that is one to one reproduction because that's what the camera is capable of or the lens is capable of rather. Uh, then I put the 1411 uh, on the, the, the TC 1411 on the camera and um, sorry. So, and then focus again. And so I know I didn't change the focus on the lens, so I know that the camera is still at one to one plus the 1.4. So that's 40% more magnification. And with the, the TC2011, uh, I get two times the uh, magnification out of it. Uh, and again, without changing the focus on the lens, just by moving the camera forward or backward. Uh, the other thing I want you to notice here, though, is the exposures on this. So F22, five seconds, F32, uh, because I had added a 1.4x converter, I'm losing a stop of light. So the, the aperture effectively goes from 22 to 32. My shutter speed has to double from five seconds to 10 seconds. Uh, again, one more stop of light loss because of the teleconverter. So the aperture goes to 45 and the time goes from 10 seconds to 20 seconds. But other than that, the exposure is staying the same. Uh, and that's the setup uh, for the next shot that you're gonna see, but you can see the, the little tabletop tripod that I had. Um, there's a, another one by Manfrotto there uh, and two little uh, light panels. And that's the camera set on, uh, or the lens uh, and the camera. You can see the focus rail. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but you can see the focus rail between the lens and the tripod head. Um, it's kind of like, like I said, a long lens plate. It clamps the camera at the back and then allows me to slide the whole system forward or backwards. So I could turn the focus ring on the lens to 100%, and then I can move the whole camera up and down until the subject's in focus. And then that's with the 1.4 converter. So you can see the lens uh, extends a little bit. The, the camera's moved up to allow some space in between the two. Um, Oh, sorry, that's with the 2X. I thought I had one with each, but I guess it doesn't make a lot of difference. But you can see the, the, the teleconverter in between uh, the lens and the camera that way. And then that's the shot that you were looking at, just a, a, a fossil of a, of a seashell. Um, again, straight uh, with the, the camera at maximum reproduction with the lens, but without uh, a teleconverter, with the 1.4 converter, and then with the 2X converter. And you can see the apertures are gonna increase each time uh, the shutter speeds increase each time as well. This time the aperture is not nearly as high. It's actually two stops lower than it was before because I'm shooting a flat subject. I don't need that much depth of field. There's a little bit of, of irregularity in the surface and you can see some, some particles and grain and whatever inside the fossil. So I wanted a little depth of field, but I didn't need a lot like the coffee beans because there's not as much depth to the subject, okay? Uh, let's talk about extension tubes then. I mentioned these before as well. Uh, an extension tube is exactly what it sounds like. It is just an empty tube that extends the lens away from the camera. The farther I move the lens or the focus elements in the lens away from the sensor, the larger the subject's going to be uh, or the larger I, I can reproduce the subject. Um, so if I took 
even a regular lens, a 51.4, an 85.14, two eights, whatever you've got, if I add some space in between the lens and the camera, I'd be able to focus closer. If I focus closer, I get more magnification. So I can get a more macro effect out of any lens, whether it's a macro lens or a standard lens. Um, they are available for almost every camera. It's, to me, it's an anomaly in, in almost anything, but in the photo world, um, there are a lot of things that you look for accessories and they're only made for this camera and not this camera and something else. And sometimes it gets frustrating, but for whatever reason, some company out there generally makes uh, a set of extension tubes for everything. Even a 40 year old film camera that nobody's made in decades, you can still find a set of extension tubes for them. So that's kind of a nice thing. You can do this type of thing or you can experiment with extension tubes with just about any camera that you've got. Um, they're ju not generally uh, incredibly expensive. They, they're readily, pretty affordable, a lot less than a, a really good lens or something. So you can take the, the good macro lens that you already have um, and add a set of extension tubes to it. <coughs> Sorry, they usually come in sets of three. So they're, <clears throat> and they're different uh, thicknesses, if you will, and they space the, the lens out in different ways. So you can use them one at a time. You can use the thin one, the middle one, the tall one, the long one. Uh, you can use any combination of two of them. You can use all three of them together. You can use more, but you start to vignette in corners if you get too many uh, extension tubes on there. I've tried that, it doesn't really work. Um, but you might be able to use more than just that one set. Um, <clears throat> the amount of increase or the increase in magnification is gonna depend on the lens that you start with and how many extension tubes you put on it. If you go back to one of those earlier slides, um, extrememacro.co.uk, there's actually a calculator on there. If I start with this lens and I add this extension tube, how much more magnification am I gonna have? Um, I think PhotoPills will do that for you as well. I'm not 100% sure on that one, but uh, sometimes it's just trial and error or just experimenting. Uh, I can tell you though, it will work better with shorter lenses than longer. Uh, one of our former lenses, we made a, a 180 millimeter macro lens. Uh, one of my favorites, absolutely love the lens, but I tried when I first got extension tubes, that lens with a full set of extension tubes on it, I'm not increasing the focal length very much compared to where it was originally. So I'm not getting that much more magnification, maybe 50% more. But if I put the same extension tubes on a shorter lens, like a 50 or a 70, I can get two or three times um, life size, uh, or two or three times uh, reproduction out of a shorter lens like that. So for these kind of things, I would say start with the uh, start with smaller lenses, shorter lenses, uh, and go from there. It will definitely reduce your working distance. Uh, and I define working distance as the distance from the, the front element of the lens to the subject, rather than close focus distance, which is a measurement from the sensor to the subject. Um, sensor to subject is kind of irrelevant when you're changing the distance from the lens to the camera by adding something in between. So it's easier just to figure out working distance. But so without those, a 50 or a 70 millimeter lens might give me three, three or four inches of, of uh, working distance from the front element. If I'm doubling the magnification, I'll probably have half that. So I might be down to one and a half inches or something like that, maybe even less. And that can be a difficult thing. Uh, you can cast shadows on the subject. It can be hard to get lights in around the camera. Uh, so that, that's an issue. The shorter the lens, the, the shorter the focal length or the shorter the working distance is gonna be. So you probably don't wanna go much below a 50 millimeter lens uh, on a full frame camera with uh, a set of extension tubes on it as well. So because they're an empty tube, they, you want the ones that have electronics. Occasionally you'll still find some that don't have uh, the sensors, the electronics, uh, the communication passing that from the camera to the lens. Without that, your lens isn't gonna really function anymore, especially modern cameras. Most of the time the apertures don't work. They won't focus um, if they're not getting power uh, from the camera, <clears throat> um, but they're a hollow tube. There's no optics in it. So all I'm doing is looking through a little less of the glass in the lens, if that makes sense. Um, I'm just looking through a, a smaller portion of the glass. So maybe ma magnifying the imperfections in the lens itself, but I'm not really adding any extra imperfections by uh, another piece of glass like a diopter or a teleconverter could be. 
Um, so again, if you're starting with a really good lens, you should get some really good results uh, using extension tubes. This was uh, with our older 70 millimeter, this was the EX uh, on an Nikon uh, without uh, extension tubes. So that's one-to-one -one. that's uh, on the sensor that was life-size. And then with a full set of extension tubes, that's really right about two and a half times, two and a quarter, something like that. I've never actually measured it out, but it's in that, that ballpark um, with all three extension tubes. And again, I went from two and a half, two and three quarters inches down to about an inch, inch and a half. I tried it with the 50 uh, and was right on top of the subject. So I knew that that wasn't going to, to work very well. Uh, and again here, uh, this is our 150 macro. Um, the EX uh, and the full set of extension tubes, you can kind of see all three of them uh, between the lens and uh, the Nikon here, the, my, the camera that I was shooting with. And this is just a long lens plate. Uh, I don't even know that that's a true macro rail because the tripod, or sorry, this lens had a tripod foot. So it just mounts on the plate and then that plate goes in the head of the tripod. Oops. And then that's a piece of bark that you're going to see in the picture in just a second. So with all three extension tubes on the 150, I'm definitely not getting up to two and a half times life size, uh, maybe 50% more, maybe two thirds, something like that. But I'm getting, uh, a, definitely getting more than uh, one to one reproduction out of it. <clears throat> um, piece of toast, kind of neat to see uh, that the tiny little details in something that you'd probably never um, stop to, to look at before, much less look at that closely. Uh, and then a nice old dried up leathery kind of leaf that I found outside. And again, this is one where if I'm right on top of that, I'm never going to be able to get the lights in the right place and get this kind of texture and detail uh, in that. So be careful with your working distances. Let's go to bellows. Uh, a bellows is definitely a dedicated kind of thing. This is not something that you probably already have sitting around unless you were using it for something else. Um, sometimes we use bellows to reproduce slides. Um, uh, they're, and they're dedicated systems for that. Uh, if you're not familiar, bellows is the accordion kind of thing um, that allows you to space the lens and the camera uh, and change that distance between the two completely variably. Almost all view cameras use bellows. Uh, so I was kind of familiar with this. And, and again, this has led me to thinking about how to focus and, and how to set up the camera because of, of uh, working with old film cameras like that. Um, but they're kind of like an extension tube in that I'm spacing out the lens from the camera. But if, uh, Bellows allows me to do it completely variably. I can change that distance. I can get a lot more distance than I could with uh, one set of, of extension tubes. Uh, I'm not nearly as likely to vignette um, looking, going through a whole set of extension tubes because the Bellows are a little bit bigger. Um, I definitely can get more magnification than a set of tubes too because the Bellows will stretch out probably three or four times as far as um, a set of extension tubes would allow me to space the camera and the lens. <clears throat> um, they generally are gonna work best with slightly wide lenses to slightly long lenses. Uh, again, with really, really big lenses all spaced out, you're not getting as much change in the, the amount of magnification. Shorter lenses, you're gonna get more of that. Uh, if you wanna get beyond one-to-one -one like a lot more, you probably want something more like um, 50, 70, 90 millimeter. Uh, again, something in that kind of range. The one drawback is almost any bellows has no, ex no electronics, uh, no communication between the camera and the lens. That can be a real problem. There are some that do, that pass electronics through them. There are some that have uh, an attachment that goes to the camera and then attaches to the lens so that the camera can still control uh, the lens that way. The, uh, if you have a manual lens that has an aperture ring on it and a focus ring that is controlled mechanically, then you can use a lens like that and you don't need that communication uh, necessarily with the camera body. Most camera bodies will fire um, if they, even if they don't, or at least you can set them to fire even if they don't have communication with a lens. <clears throat> but if you don't have that, you're probably going to be limited to shooting with the aperture either wide open or stopped all the way down, depending on what system it was uh, the lens was designed for. Some lenses, when you take them off the camera, they, the apertures stay open, some of them they stay closed. Um, so you probably though, you're probably gonna be limited to shooting at one aperture or another on a lens that doesn't have a mechanical aperture control. Um, 
For this, think about it this way, your magnification is gonna be controlled by the rear standard, the part that's holding the camera body. Focus is gonna be done by the front or by moving the whole thing. But by stretching the difference, the distance between the two, I move the camera back, I'm gonna get more magnification if my lens stays in the same place. Then I can refocus by moving everything up and down or just by moving the, the lens up and down. Again, this is one of those where I mentioned before at the beginning, <clears throat> changing the focus ring on the lens when you have this much magnification isn't really changing much of anything. <clears throat> um, to get, to really focus this, you're really gonna have to move the whole standard um, that's holding the lens or move the whole system up and down. Uh, and I'll show you uh, an image or a, an illustration of that in just a second. Um, so I, I don't know really what the magnification is on these. This is with our 70 macro. And the reason I was shooting with that is it's an older lens and has an aperture ring um, and a mechanical focus uh, ring on it. So I can use that nicely on, uh, on that, on the bellows. Uh, so a set of toothpicks, uh, an old nut that I found, uh, that's the whole thing's only an inch tall. So the part you're looking at is, you know, half or three quarters of an inch or something like that, um, filling an inch and a half frame. So it's definitely more than uh, life size, probably closer to two and a half or three times life size. Uh, and there you can see uh, the rig, the, again, our 70 EX lens, the, mag, the bellows in between, the camera body on the back. And you can see the standards, uh, the part holding the front lens, and it attaches and has a, a knob there that adjusts the focus and allow, or adjusts the movement of that standard up and down. The rear standard holding the camera body um, has a focus uh, or geared ring as well, so it can move that standard. And then the whole thing clamps to the tripod uh, and I can unlock it and slide the whole bellows unit uh, up and down. So it allows for a lot of pretty precise uh, controls over magnification and uh, focus. And that was the, the nut that I was shooting. That's a, and the next thing you're gonna see is a piece of currency from China. And that's not even the size of a normal uh, dollar bill, and they're actually quite a bit smaller than that. Um, <clears throat> so you can see the the details in uh, those types of currency. You can even see the individual fibers uh, in the paper when you look in some of the parts on that. All right, another uh, technique, and this is uh, a reversing ring. It is a ring that fits between the lens and the camera but it allows you to reverse the lens, turn it around and put the front of the lens facing the camera. So you're actually using the lens backward. Uh, and without getting into a lot of optics, um, long lenses tend to um, <clears throat> have narrow angles of, of view. So if I turn them around, they, end up, they actually end up kind of wider than you might think. And a wide angle lens because they bring something in from the front and then focus it onto the sensor. If I turn that around, it's gonna pull something in closer and then spread it out to the sensor. So wide angle lenses actually give me more magnification with a reversing ring than a longer lens does. Um, in general, there's some differences in lens designs and whatever, but this is one time that it's probably better to use a wide angle lens um, than it is to use the longer lenses. Uh, and you could use a macro, you could try a 50 or something, a macro uh, and reverse it. Uh, reversing rings usually come in kits. Uh, so you usually have a ring that is a filter thread. It screws on the front of the lens that where the filters would go. The other side of that ring is a camera mount or the, the rear mount from a lens that fits on the camera and locks in place. Then there's usually, if your lens, especially for uh, a Nikon or some older uh, Nikon SLR glass and some older lenses that had mechanical apertures, um, they come with a ring that fits on the rear of the lens that's now facing forward and allows you to change the aperture. If you don't have that, it can be a problem. I can tell you what I did to overcome that, but I'm not gonna recommend that you try it. Um, it could theoretically cause some, some problems, but I'll get to that in just a second when I show it to you. Um, <clears throat> I'll show you what I did. Uh, again, usually there's no electronics uh, to the lens this way because the, the mount on the, uh, the lens is facing out away from the camera. So you don't have any control over the aperture or the focus uh, or any of those kind of things. So if your camera doesn't 
have, or your lens doesn't have a, a mechanically coupled uh, focus ring, it can be a problem. If it doesn't have a mechanical aperture, it can be a problem. So using a manual lens with an aperture ring uh, and manual focus ring can be an advantage for this type of thing. Or you can do, like I said, what I did, and that is locking the aperture in place as you remove it from a camera. I'll give you, I, again, I'll, I'll, I'll admit what I did in just a minute. Uh, you're gonna focus by moving the entire camera or your macro rail, long lens plate, whatever it is. You're gonna slide the whole system forward or backward. Again, that focus ring on the lens on this one is probably not gonna do much good. Uh, there definitely can be a loss of quality, image quality this way. You, uh, one of the common things that happens is chromatic aberration. Light camera lenses were never designed for the light rate light to go through the other way. Manufacturers spend a lot of time to control how the light goes from the front to the back, but it's never designed, it was ne they were never designed to have light go from the back to the front. Um, so you can end up increasing uh, lens aberrations, imperfections this way instead of uh, the other way. And I'll show you an example of that as well. So this is our 24 millimeter art and it's the lens I wanted to use and it's the lens that I had a reversing ring to fit. It's a Sony mount lens and Sony doesn't have uh, a mechanical aperture. But I figured out that I could put the lens on a camera, on a Sony camera, set the aperture where I wanted it to be, and without turning the camera off, take the lens off the front of the camera, put it on my Nikon and fire. So what I had to do is put it on the Sony, open the aperture all the way up to wide open, put it on the, uh, take it off the Sony, put it on the front of my Nikon and um, get the focus and the composition, not much composition with this one, but get the focus where it needed to be then very, very carefully, without messing up the whole system, moving the subject or the camera or anything, take the lens back off, put it on the Sony, set the aperture all the way down, take it back off the Sony, put it back on the front of the Nikon, and take a photograph um, that way. Uh, and then balance my exposure using shutter speed. Like I said, I don't recommend it. It's probably not a good thing to remove lenses from cameras with them turned on. Uh, it's also not a great idea to have, especially mirrorless cameras, uh, turned on with the uh, sensor exposed. It's a great way to pick up dust and all sorts of stuff like that. But uh, again, with a 24 millimeter lens, uh, normally a wide angle kind of lens, I'm getting quite a bit of magnification uh, out of a kitchen towel, uh, out of the surface of uh, the granite of my countertop, uh, the wood of a cutting board. Uh, I think that's maple and walnut, if I remember that correctly. And then some watch parts that I had, and I threw this one in here. I think it's pretty evident. You should be able to see on your screen as well. If you notice that gear uh, on the left side, it's got a lot of fringing around, uh, especially way over on the left side. Um, that's chromatic aberration. That's really not um, supposed to be there. And again, this lens straight on the camera with the light rays coming in the way they were designed, you'd never see this. Um, that lens controls chromatic aberration really, really well. But with reversing rings looking through it backward, that's just something that you, you may have problems with. Uh, so this is another technique in uh, advanced macro, that's something that I have uh, a lot of requests for. We kind of mention it in the basic macro class, but then it always opens up a can of worms because people want to know more and more about it. So I put it in here. It's not a, an accessory. It's not an, a, a piece of equipment or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> but normally, depth of field can be a, a challenge to get enough um, to have everything in your image that you want in focus to get it all in focus. There are usually three ways to get more depth of field. Sorry, there's usually two ways, and this is the third. Um, the first is turn the aperture up. The higher that number, the smaller the opening, the smaller the opening, the more uh, in an image appears to be sharp. The second is back up. The farther I am from the subject, the more depth of field that I'm, I'm going to get. Um, all else being equal. If I have the same camera and just back up and refocus, I'll have more depth of field. But I also don't get the composition the way I want it that way. And, I, and I'll have to crop uh, and lose resolution uh, in either in camera or in the computer later. Uh, the third then is what's called focus stacking. And focus stacking is taking multiple images, 
with small or shallow um, strips of depth of field of focus and then allowing a computer program. There are some cameras that will do this in camera as well. Usually though, you shoot it in camera, you take it into a computer and software will put it back together um, so that everything that you shot, each of those focus uh, parts that were in focus get combined and you have more focus. Um, <clears throat> the nicer thing too is I can shoot with shorter shutter speeds. I can shoot with shallower apertures. I'm usually gonna get sharper images. I can shoot faster. Um, so it's easier to take the photographs for focus stacking. It's not easy if anything moves. So this is probably not something you wanna do outside. It is definitely not something you wanna to try to learn to do outside. Um, find something inside to shoot, go to the garden center, grocery store, buy yourself a nice orchid, uh, set it up and, and practice this with uh, your camera inside when nothing's moving on you. Um, the basic process is I'm gonna focus on the very closest thing to me, to the camera, that I want to be in focus. So it's usually the very, very, um, the part of the flower that's closest, that's sticking out the most. I'm just gonna focus right on that. Um, I probably am gonna shoot around 5.6, uh, F8, F5.6, something like that. That'll give me a nice little bit of depth of field. Then I'm gonna refocus and overlap about 50%, a third of the focus each time. And I'm just gonna refocus the camera and keep taking pictures until the farthest thing I want in focus is in focus. And then I stop, then I take all those images uh, to the computer and put them back together. There are a number of ways to refocus the camera. Uh, some cameras will do that automatically. Uh, this is a, a Nikon D850. It has focus stacking built in. It will automate the capture of the images. It won't stitch them back together, but it will automate the capture. I know there's some Olympus cameras that will actually uh, focus, change the focus, take the pictures and put them all back together uh, in the camera. Not familiar enough with which models do that, which don't, so don't, don't ask me that one. But um, if you don't have a camera that does it, a lens with an electronically controlled aperture, or sorry, electronically controlled focus or focus by wire like our 105 DGDN, um, or the 70 uh, millimeter macro art that we make for, for Sony and L-mount uh, and Canon for that matter, uh, allows me to focus very, very, very precisely, very small adjustments from uh, closest to farthest. Um, so I found that I can do this manually uh, with the focus ring on lenses like that. On older lenses with physical couplings, uh, mechanical focus, it's very difficult to get very, very small precise adjustments. Um, there are cameras that you can use live view and touch the screen and have it refocus. You could do it that way. There are um, apps that can do it. Maybe they came with your phone. Um, there are accessories that connect to, or, uh, connect to the, com the cameras and control focus that way. Um, one of the ones I've used is called Cam Ranger. Uh, it will automate that process as well. You can just push start, it'll take a number of pictures, however many you tell it, and then you can just hit start again and it'll take more if you didn't get enough. Um, then you're gonna put these back together in the computer. Photoshop and Lightroom will do it. It does it okay, they do it okay. Um, I found that for some images, Lightroom and Photoshop tends to leave kind of a ghosted edge, a halo around uh, parts of the image, especially the parts that were close to the camera to begin with. Uh, and in focus to begin with, they tend to have this kind of halo around them. I'm told Helicon works really well. Uh, they make a program called Helicon Focus. Uh, I've used a, a platform called Zerene, Z-E-R-E-N-E. -E. Uh, it's on the slide there. Um, that's what I find works the best and the easiest. Uh, it's a plugin in Lightroom, so I can just select the images, send it to Zerene. It stacks all the images together and saves it as a 16-bit TIFF, I think, something like that. Um, so this is a single exposure, again, inside, so nothing's moving. Uh, 30, F32, and I still don't quite have the front of the flower here or the, the back of the flowers, the back of the petals up here, all the way in focus, uh, even at 15 seconds uh, and F32. So what I do, what I did is, um, again, stack. Uh, so shoot each one at F5.6. Uh, uh, they're about two thirds of a second per frame. And there we go, you can see them, um, a slice of focus, each one, the camera just refocused. This was using the Cam Ranger before I had the, the D850. Um, so it refocuses 
it takes another picture, refocuses, takes another picture, and it would do that uh, automatically. Uh, and then I just take them to the computer and put them all together and I get everything in focus in a single image. So that's called focus stacking. Uh, it, don't be intimidated. It's really not as hard uh, as it sounds. The, the two things that are the most important is one, make sure your subject or your camera doesn't move. Movement will just destroy this. If you've ever done HDR uh, or anything photo merge for, for panoramics, anything like that, if something moves between one frame and the next, they don't combine right. Then it's the same here. Uh, the other trick is make sure you get enough overlap in the focus. So big adjustments, you'll get stripes of focus and then stripes of out of focus in between. So you wanna have a, a, enough focus to begin with and enough overlap between each one that the software can put it all back together. Uh, and then a couple other examples. This was 13 frames, uh, even those each at F8, just because of the, the, the proximity, I'm so close to this, this subject. Um, if you know anything about a fly vice, that's a tiny little fly. Um, that's in the front of it, but, and there was no way to get all of that in the single exposure. Uh, it took that much, uh, 13 images to get from the front of those uh, hairs in the front all the way to uh, the vise and the hook in the back. Uh, and again, that's with the new 105 DGDN. And another one, uh, since I had it set up, uh, again, those hairs that are coming towards you going away, there's no way in the world you're gonna get all of that in a single exposure at that composition, at that kind of magnification. Uh, a couple other possibilities here, uh, taking this to a, another level, even beyond what we've been talking about. You can combine some of the things that we've been talking about. You can put extension tubes on the back of bellows uh, and get even more reach. Um, you could put a diopter on the front of a lens on a, a set of bellows. Um, you could use your bellows and do focus stacking. And that's really nice because you have that geared uh, movement on the front standard. So it's a really easy way to precisely uh, change the amount of focus in between shots. Uh, I mentioned the Cam Ranger. Uh, it, it's great for focus stacking. Uh, Helicon has a new uh, product, a newer product called the FB Tube. Um, that's kind of like an extension tube and a uh, automated system for uh, doing the focus stacking as well. Plugs in the camera, controls the lens. So that might be something you want, you could look at as well. And then the real extreme of this is a product from Cognizus called the Stack Shot. Uh, it automates everything. It will move your entire camera. It will refocus your lens. It will take the pictures. Uh, if you've ever seen the shots of the eye of a bee, um, those images are 200 photographs or 300 photographs stacked together. And the only way to get um, that many images with that shallow a depth of field perfectly um, composed and, and shot and focused and everything is something that automates the process for you, um, like that stack shot. You can couple lenses. So you can actually take a reversing ring, put one lens on the camera, you can put another one in front of that. You can reverse a, a lens on the front of another lens. Uh, you can use enlarger lenses by themselves or even microscope lenses by themselves or reversed on the front of another lens. So there's all sorts of different combinations uh, and ways to take this to another level if you want to get beyond like two or three times life size if you're trying to get to five or ten. Um, that's the way that's usually done. And I'll leave you with just a couple thoughts. Macros already tough. When we enlarge an image, we're enlarging everything. We're magnifying everything. So we're magnifying the shake of the camera. We're magnifying the movement of the subject. Um, we're magnifying the imperfections of our lenses or our systems to begin with. Taking this to a higher level, getting more magnification just makes that more complicated. Be patient. Um, that kind of leads me to the next one, but um, don't get frustrated with this. It's really easy um, to just you know, try one thing and it not work out. Try to figure out what's not working. Step back and look at it again. Um, give everything some time. And again, make sure everything stays rock solid. Um, and then learn from other people. Uh, find images online. There are all sorts of great resources for extreme macro or advanced macro like this. Uh, Facebook groups, camera clubs, uh, mentors, uh, other things. Um, I'd say this about anything in photography. Learn from your strengths, uh, learn from your successes, learn from your failures, uh, save yourself time, learn from other people's failures. Uh, take their advice uh, when they've already learned things the hard way. All right, I hope that was not totally overwhelming, um, but a good bit of information. 
that was that was definitely informative at, at the at the very bare minimum. <laughs> so I, I would I would consider it a win. Brett, thank you again for being here. Sigma, Absolutely. thanks again for sponsoring. Uh, we'll catch you again for the next uh, event space virtually. Thanks for joining us.